On this holy night, as we come into a place of prayer, let us call together our hearts and our minds, our thoughts and emotions, and come to worship the Lord our God. I invite you, if you are able, to please stand. The table is set before us. The feast is prepared for us. A meal of bread and wine, a feast and bitter herbs. The Lord calls us to this supper of remembrance. The Lord calls us to serve and to be served. As we break the bread and share the cup, of our understanding may fail us. But we will never forget Christ's example. We will never forget the full extent of his love. Our hymn this evening is hymn number 450, here in our upper room.
As we come to this table and as we worship again Him only, we know that You bless us with Your Holy Spirit that fills our hearts with a sense of contentment that goes beyond our imagining and helps us to deal with each and every day of life. We thank You, O God, our Lord and Creator, the one who has given us this day that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. Amen. As we come to the table and as we come to think about Jesus in this night with his friends in the upper room, we come to think about our faults and failings in life, the times that we done something that hurt someone or ourselves, that thought wrongly about someone else or judged quickly. And we come knowing those things. They don't go away, uh, but they become a part of our thoughts. And we're lucky that, not lucky, we're blessed that we have a Savior who can help us and forgive us and help us walk the righteous life. So let us now pray the prayer of confession in unison. Loving Christ, on that night long ago, you knew that our hour had come. You knew full well what lay ahead of you. Your disciples loved you and followed you, but they had also failed you. They would fail you yet again that night, and one would betray you. Yet you washed their feet as a servant would, even in the feet of we have also loved you and followed you. We have also failed you, and we cannot comprehend the love that you show us, the love that is our example, the love that tells us to do as you have done for us. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our words of forgiveness come from the psalmist, Psalm 27, verse 1 and verse 13. The psalmist says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Of whom? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And please be seated. Stories in the Bible carry great strength and power and bring us to imagine what it might have been to have been with Jesus in the upper room. And the stories that we hear tonight have come through the ages, across centuries, and have inspired Christian people around the globe to know that this is a very special and holy night. We take the reading tonight from the Gospel of John, and there in the 13th chapter we find the story about Jesus washing his disciples' feet. Uh, a great act of humility, a great act of offering an example to his disciples. Uh, and he is the one to do this, even though the custom in Palestinian times, Palestine and ancient Israel, was that when you entered the home of a friend and you were the guest, immediately someone would jump up, usually the servant, and they would come to you and remove your sandals and wash your feet for you because that was the way to relax and be accepted into the home. And uh, then you would be a part of that household. Jesus does that tonight to invite us in to be a part of his household. Listen to this story from John chapter 13, 1 to 5. Now before the festival of the Passover, 
Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. And having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table. He arose from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. And then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. I would like to invite Rob and Amy to come forward for the foot washing. feet. You also ought to wash one another's feet. 
For I have sent you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. So very truly I tell you, you're, you're, you tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. For the word of God and the wisdom of God in scripture, for the word of God in this passage, this story that carries for us such strength and hope in the word of God in our lives each and every day. Thanks be to God. Amen. <clears throat> of service, O oh Lord, simple ways of loving and showing that love to one another, simple expressions of kindness and gratitude, these are all a part, O oh Lord, of the foot washing that we have seen this night, and your blessing is upon each and every one of us as we seek to be your servants of service. Uh, peace and hope and strength in the world, loving one another as you have loved us. So give us, O oh God, open ears to hear now the message that you bring this night that has already been so wonderfully shown to us in the reading from John. And may you strengthen our witness to you and to your Son and to the hope that there is for the world in that person that we call Jesus, the one that we came that we might have life and have it more abundantly and richly and eternally in his name. We ask it and say that, we humbly say that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts might be found pleasing and acceptable to you, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. As I prepared for this uh, moment of reflection, uh, I couldn't help but think of times that I've been in a Monday Thursday service, and uh, it, it, it went way back to my childhood, uh, when Mom and Dad would take my sister and I to the first Evangelical and Reformed Church in Akron, and the lights would be low, and we'd have communion, and we'd have the tenebrae, and it left an indelible impression on my heart, and it became so much a part of me that I was so glad when I met Debbie and we got married that she also belonged to a church that had tenebrae. You know, it was just a kind of like, oh, thank you. Uh, it was that important to be a part of this evening. Uh, and the phrase that jumped out to me from the first part of the reading was, he loved them to the end. <laughs> well, I don't know why John put that in there. But it just hit my heart that here he had been with these disciples, this group of men and women who had followed him for two and a half years in his ministry to all of Israel, actually, but mostly in the Galilee, up in the northern part of Israel. And he had taught them and shown them healings, and he had brought such hope and promise to their lives and had shown them the love of God and the grace that was unconditional. And even now on this night, when he knew that he was going to return to the Father. That's in that reading. He knew, and he loved them to the end. And when he saw that no one jumped up to wash feet, which would have been the hospitable thing to do, someone of the disciples would have thought, but they didn't, and so it was phrased during the supper, the Passover. So here they were in the upper room, having a Passover meal to remember what God had done for the Israelites to bring them out of slavery and death and all sorts of horrendous things in Egypt had given them the liberty of freedom. They're celebrating that 
tonight as friends, a Jewish tradition. And here in the middle of that, Jesus gets up and washes feet. I have to believe that that also becomes a sacrament, even though we don't practice it very often in the United Church of Christ. It, there's the washing of the feet, there's the communion, it's that he loved them to the end, no matter what they had done. Our prayer of confession talked about betrayal. It says that he even washed the feet of the betrayer, Judas, as we know. What kind of love is that that is an example for us today in our divided world? Uh, so it was a sacred holy night. And the similarities also spoke to me this evening because I have a Jewish son-in-law and we had a Seder meal with his family uh, and it was a beautiful night that someone in the family says to the mother, moms, you're an important part of this kind of religious ceremony at home and we're in their home. There's a good gathering, 14 family members and friends and neighbors. Why is this night so different from other nights, mom? Tell us, what makes this night so special? And the mother would then recite the whole tradition, the whole story again of the Exodus out of Egypt, coming to the Red Sea. I watched a little bit of the Ten Commandments last week. <laughs> I always think it's really kind of cool the way they did it back then. And there they are, and the Red Sea parts, and they go across, and they're saved from destruction and slavery in Egypt. <laughs> to have that as a background to the Holy Communion, the interface of Passover Holy Communion, and we know what's going to happen to Jesus tomorrow. And so when the Israelites splash the blood of the Lamb on their doorposts, the angel of death going over those parts of the ancient uh, Israel, you know, uh, Egypt, and those people are spared. The symbolism of that comes home to us knowing that tomorrow he dies on the cross. <clears throat> he becomes our pastoral lamb. Remember when I preached here once, I said, there's a lamb on your hymn book? And I thought, that is so cool that your background in hymnology has the Lamb of Jesus on your hymn book as a part of your theology of music and also, also your theology as a church. So by keeping Passover and the Lord's Supper as meals, and they become a day of remembrance. And that's another question that gets asked in the Seder meal. Why do we remember this night? That is an important word. Because we, as we remember, we relive the story. We become a part of the experience. It happens to us today, 2,200 years later, whenever. And when we go to, into the Holy Communion and we have that sacrament of the Eucharist, we say in our tradition, as we take the bread and the cup, do this in remembrance of me. Because it's as if we're in that upper room. And that's why this particular night is so special to me. And Jesus inter inter comes into that and puts into that whole story of the foot washing. Uh, which is kind of embarrassing. I mean, that water was so hot when I poured it on Rob's feet tonight. I thought, holy cow. You know, it's like, whoa. He didn't say anything. I thought, I bet he's gripping his teeth, though. <laughs> but, I mean, it was that, it's like, it's kind of like, uh, a little unusual for us and maybe a little embarrassing. But we do this in remembrance of Jesus as he did it. And we understand that he is referring to the Holy Communion, but he's also referring perhaps to the foot washing. And these become sacred words for us as we partake of this evening. So in John's Gospel, you don't hear 
The words of communion of the Last Supper, kind of interesting, isn't it? Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there's the story of the Holy Communion. Very right? in different ways, but still pretty much similar. John doesn't have that. But we do hear John in giving us this story of the foot washing. And so Jesus does a sacred act of compassion. He got up from the table, and I said in the reading of that scripture, uh, he arose. That, the, the translation was fine if he got up, but actually the word the Greek for it is he arose. Now I want you to think, up from the grave he arose. He arose. John is using the Greek for a purpose there. Because other stories in John have Jesus healing the paralytic. And he says to the paralyzed man, Arise. You are going to have resurrection this day. And then in Luke's gospel, we hear that. Luke has that same word for Jesus arising out of the grave. The same Greek word. Jesus asks an important question. He says, I have set for you an example. And he asks the question, do you know what I have done for you? That takes some thought. It takes some conversation. It takes your, perhaps talking it over with your spouse or significant other or your family. Do you know what Jesus has done for you? He's asking his disciples. He's there in the middle of the Passover, ready to institute the Holy Communion. And he asks this question, do you know why I washed your feet? Do you know what I've done? What exactly is it then that we think he is doing when we wash feet? It's a mystery of faith. But as a disciple of Christ in today's world, I need to follow that example. We break bread, we drink wine, we wash one another's feet. And Jesus himself asks the question, do you know what I have done? And we need to ask that tonight. We need to ask it tomorrow. We need to ask it on Easter. We need to ask it next week when we might go back to our jobs or our schools or whatever that partakes of our life so much that kind of dominates our life. Do we know what he has done for us? It's not just only about the cross tomorrow, which is so significant. But it's about everything in his life, his baptism, his birth. It's about his healing and his teaching. It's about the body and the blood tomorrow. It's about the basin and the towel and the water. It's about his life and death. Do we know what he has done for us? God's delivering us is not an invitation to pay God back. What are we delivered from? From sin? From condemnation? From shame? From our own little prisons of slavery that enslave us, whatever that might be? God delivers us from that. But it's not payback time to God because we know that we are saved as many of my Baptist friends call it. I'm a saved Christian. All right. What is it that we know that God has done? Whatever we know, we do it with gratitude. The invitation is to give and give with love. The psalmist says in Psalm 116, which is also the psalm assigned for this evening, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice <clears throat> and my supplications. And the psalmist says, I love the Lord who heard my cry. I love the Lord and the Lord chased away my grief. 
and my sorrow. And I let my heart no more despair while I have breath to pray my, my prayer of gratitude to God. Jesus that night hiked up his road, he got down on his tired knees, he took his disciples' weathered, dusty feet into his carpenter's hands, and he washed them. And Peter says, no, I should be washing you. And Jesus says, but Peter, this is what love looks like. So when you and I get confused in the next few weeks when Easter becomes a memory, and we might remember this night, when we get confused, John's Gospel helps us out. For it is only in John that Jesus got up from the table, literally arose, the same Greek term that I referenced earlier, and that becomes an act of resurrection before he's even resurrected. Giving us glimpses of what resurrection will look like. So the act of getting up from the table, taking the basin and the towel, is not an act of weakness. It's not, you know, there's some conversation going on right now in the country about what it means to be a man. Uh, and I, I mean, I'm old enough to remember this going on way back when I was younger. And there are certain things that are more feminine than masculine and blah, blah, blah. And here Jesus is the one washing feet. So it's not an act of weakness, which is sometimes associated with being feminine in the world. Which, ladies, believe me, I don't believe that. Uh, ask it. <laughs> but what is happening here is an act that is powerful. It's empowering service. It's giving men the permission to work in a way for Christ that others won't accept. So as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup that we will have in a few moments, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And I would add to that, as often as you are humble enough to be in service to Christ, to do acts of mercy and kindness, that is a holy act. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. The genius of all this is that everyone can do it. Uh, we need to break the 80-20 rule in churches. You know, 20% of the people do all the work, 80% come, you know, they come. But the genius of being a foot washer and the genius of being someone who comes to the table to accept the gift of grace in, in uh, bread and cup the genius of that is, whoever you are, and wherever you find yourself on life's journey, all of us can be a part of that. All of us can serve. And the act becomes almost Jesus' silent way of saying to the disciples, this is what I want you to be on this night. And he takes and lays everything aside in the middle of a meal that celebrates liberation. And he strips, and he kneels, and he washes his followers, and he looks up and he says, do this as I have set an example for you. May God add understanding to this message. I am still not at a point of total understanding myself, but may God open our minds and our hearts to listen intently to the word and the story that is a part of our lives this night. And let us be grateful, because the Lord has heard our cry, and the Lord blesses us with a wonderful love and grace. Amen.
This is Christ's table, and all are welcome to this table. General reminder to you that uh, the cups with the ribbon on them, this cup here and the cup at the other end, those cups are uh, the ones with wine. And the ones without the, the ribbon, the, this cup and that cup, those are the grape juice cups. There's gluten-free options here for those who wish to have that. Please let us know when we serve you. And if you are unable to come forward, please remain in your seat and we will come to you. In remembrance we gather,
May we pray together. Oh Jesus, in this holy week, you pray that we would love one another as you have loved us. Tonight we have tried to practice what you have taught us. Let the love, joy, and humility we have known here continue to bless us. And let us share that blessing with the world. You love and gave your life for. May the peace we feel together in this place point us for the hope of Easter. reading is from Matthew chapter 26 verses 20 through 25. When it was evening, he took his place with the twelve, and while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they became greatly distressed and began to say to him one after another, Surely not I, Lord. He answered, the one who has dipped his hand in the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. Judas, who betrayed him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. He replied, You have said so. Lord, have mercy. Christ, Christ. 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 A reading from Luke, chapter 22, verses 40 to 44. When he reached the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not come into the time of trial. Then he withdrew from them about a th stone's throw, knelt down, and prayed, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet 
not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel from heaven appeared to him and gave him great strength. In his anguish he prayed more earnestly. His sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. The Lord have mercy. Christ. Christ. and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again he went away for the second time and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hand of sinners. Rise, let us go, here comes my betrayer. Lord, have mercy. The Shadow of Desertion. Matthew chapter 26, verses 47 through 50, 55 through 56. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd with swords and clubs, from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man, arrest him. At once he came up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you are here to do. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. At that hour Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But all this has taken place, so that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy. chapter 26, verses 59 to 67. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for false testimony against Jesus, so that they might put him to death. But they found none. Though many false, many false witnesses came forward, at last two came forward and said, The fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. The high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But Jesus was silent. Then the high priest said to put to him, I put you under oath before the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus then said to him, You have said so, but I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He was blasphemed. Why do we still need witnesses? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? They answered, He deserves death. Then they spat in his face and struck him, and some slapped him. Lord, have mercy. Christ, 
A reading from Mark, um, chapter 15, verses 12 through 20. Jesus spoke to them again. Then what do you want me to do with the man that you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, crucify him. Pilate asked again, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that's the governor's headquarters, and they, they called together the whole cohort. And they clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, put it on his head. And they began saluting him, Hail, King of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed. They spat on him. They knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his clothes back on him. They led him out to be crucified. Lord have mercy. Christ, Christ have mercy. mercy. Luke chapter 23, verses 33 to 46. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on the right and other on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by, watching. But the leader scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, the Chosen One. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise.
crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being through Him. And without Him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in Him was life, and the life was the light of all 